Magandang araw pong muli sa inyong lahat. My name is Dr. Jeff Lerebron and welcome to our pre-recorded lecture for the subject Nursing Care of the High-Risk Newborn to Maturity. For this session, we will be learning about Sudden Infant Death Syndrome. We will also be discussing about sepsis, particularly GBS infection, ophthalmia neonatorum, hepatitis B infection, herpes virus infection along with HIV or AIDS. And we will also be learning on how to take care of the infants of drug and alcohol dependent mothers along with babies from diabetic mothers. So please bring out your handouts and your ball pens and we will have a fun-filled learning session for this video. The first topic that we will be learning is about the sudden infant death syndrome or what we call SIDS. It is the unexplained death in infancy because of prolonged or unexplained apnea. In sudden infant death syndrome, we typically see this in the first year of life of our patients. So one year or below, these are the people who are more prone to having the sudden infant death syndrome, which is the unexplained death, usually during the sleep of a child, of a seemingly healthy baby that is less than a year old. SIDS is sometimes called the crib death because infants often die in their cribs. Parents will think na ay, ang healthy ng anak ko. And then when they put the baby to sleep, after a few hours, they just discovered that the child is already death, dead. Namatay na siya sa kanyang crib. So kaya siya tinawag na sudden infant death syndrome. Now, there are predisposing factors why this uh, condition occurs. Uh, number one is closely spaced pregnancies. Kung yung mga anak mo ay uh, sunod-sunod at walang mag magandang, uh, magandang spacing, that can lead to sudden infant death syndrome. It is a predisposing factor. Aside from that, patients who are underweight are typically the victims of this condition. Specifically, yung mga preterm infants who may have problems in their respiratory system or those who are twins who are... Uh, Basically, we know that multiple births can lead to uh, small for gestational age. Kaya din sila prone to having sudden infant death syndrome, yung mga twins, because of their size, which is small for gestational age. And also, SIDS can be seen in patients uh, who are born from narcotic-dependent mothers or yung mga drug addicts na nanay. Uh, this is also seen uh, predominantly in races like Native Americans and uh, Alaskans, I should say. And from people with low socioeconomic status, SIDS is also very common. So those are the predisposing factors for the sudden infant death syndrome. Aside from the predisposing factors that we have mentioned a while ago, there are also other possible contributing factors to sudden infant death syndrome. And number one is the viral respiratory infections. Infants with viral respiratory infections have the highest possibility of suffering or being victims of SIDS. Aside from that, infants with pulmonary edema or brainstem injuries may also be predisposed to having SIDS. Also, infants with neurotransmitter deficiencies or distorted familiar breathing patterns, meaning um, it is in their genes, pasa-pasa, that there are problems when it comes to their breathing patterns. Also, children with decreased arousal response, yung mga bata na pag ginigising natin ay mahirap bumabangon. They also... That can also contribute to sudden infant death syndrome. Aside from that, possible lack of surfactants is also seen as a contributing factor in our uh, sudden infant death syndrome. Aside from that, sleeping prone is also uh, backed by evidence to be one of the leading causes of sudden infant death syndrome um, because the respiratory muscles are restricted when the child is sleeping prone, meaning the muscles cannot uh, move properly when the child is in prone position when they are sleeping or when they are sleeping on their stomachs. Uh, also, when you expose the child to uh, soft surfaces during sleep, such as adult mattress, when you let the child sleep in the couch or a chair or under soft coverings, that can also lead to uh, sudden infant death syndrome. It is also believed, I should say, to cause sudden uh, infant death syndrome because people believe that this condition is also caused by suffocation. Also, sleep, sleeping, the child is sleeping under a soft or loose bedding or 
the child is too hot during sleep. So those are seen as possible reasons why the child may be, uh, may be a victim of the SIDS. Now when a child dies of sudden infant death syndrome, we can no longer give any therapeutic intervention to the child or to the kid because he's already dead. But the best thing that we can do is offer support to the parents that are left behind by the child or the infant. So parents may sometimes have difficulty accepting the death of the newborn or their infant because it is so sudden. Uh, healthy lang yung bata kanina nung nilagay nila sa crib and then namatay na so uh, that makes it very difficult for them to accept the death of the child uh, they may have uh, psychosomatic symptoms wherein these parents may feel nausea they may feel stomach pain or epigastric pain vertigo because of uh, the grief that they are feeling because of the emotional sadness that they are feeling so the best thing that we can give is emotional support so like I said Parents should be counseled at the time of the infant's death and give emotional support. So the best thing that you can do is offer your ears and your shoulders to these parents. Allow them to verbalize their emotions. Allow them to grieve. And if they don't want your presence there, respect their solitude. So pag sinabi nilang, sir, baka pwedeng iwan mo muna kami. Respect that. You have to leave them and give them time to grieve on their own. Aside from that, autopsy reports can also be given to the parents immediately because knowing that the cause of death is unknown or unexplained will also help them reassure themselves that the death of a child is not their fault because basically they feel very sad uh, about the death of their children and since uh, no particular disease is discovered to be the cause of the death of the child, they may think na kasalanan nila kung bakit namatay yung anak nila. So the best thing that you can also do is also give them the autopsy report and explain to them that the cause of the child, that the child's death is not their fault. I cannot stress how important it is that we give emotional support to parents whose children die of sudden infant death syndrome. If these parents have other children, we have to reassure them that SIDS is a disease of infants and that this will not kill all their children. Some of the parents might believe that SIDS is contagious and that all of their children will also die from the same fate. Baka mamatay lahat sila because of sudden infant death syndrome. Baka yun ang kanilang isipin. The best thing that we can do is we give them emotional support and also educate them about the nature of the disease. Aside from that, if a parent wished for the death of a child, for example, that child is from an unwanted or an unaccepted pregnancy, we have to reassure her that her wish is not the cause of the death. Of the child. Sabihin natin, mother, alam namin na hindi mo po gusto yung inyong pagbubuntis at hindi mo gusto yung inyong anak, pero hindi po dahil doon kaya namatay yung inyong anak. It is because of the sudden infant death syndrome. Alright? So in the event na these parents have a new child, okay? Uh, kunwari namatayan sila ng anak because of sudden infant death syndrome, and then in the event na nagkaroon ulit sila ng new child, a parents tend to be frightened. Takot na takot sila because they think or they are afraid that SIDS will get their child once again. So what do we do? We have to offer emotional support to these mothers or to these parents until past the point at which their infant died. So kunwari yung previous na anak nila na may SIDS na matay nung 8 months old, Siyempre, pag yung bagong anak nila, 8 months old na, yung nanay, nininervyos na yan. Baka ulit mamatay na naman yung anak ko kasi ganitong, uh, ganitong month na namatay yung anak ko noon na nagka-seeds din. So what do we do? We have to offer them emotional support during those difficult moments because they are thinking that the same uh, thing that happened in their past will also again happen to their child. Diba ka mamatayan ulit sila ng anak during that period. So, we have to hold their hand, give them emotional support, and educate these parents. Another thing that is important for you to know and understand is sepsis during infancy or during neonatal period. Sepsis also means infection. 
And you have to remember that newborns are at a risk of having infection due to their immature immune system. And there are different uh, reasons or different sources of these infections. These infections can either be from infections which has crossed the placenta in utero, or these infections can also be contracted from exposure to secretions from vaginal delivery. And also, there, these in, infections can also be contracted from healthcare providers such as midwives, nurses, and doctors, especially if they are not practicing hand washing. Uh, one of the most common infections uh, that is seen in neonatal period or the infancy period is the beta-hemolytic group B streptococcal infection which is the major cause of infection and uh, bakit siya major and typical cause of infection because this microorganism is a natural inhabitant of the female genital tract so basically you can see this infection in patients who are delivered via normal spontaneous delivery or what we call vaginal delivery and this may be spread from one baby to another if hand washing is not done so that can cross from one baby to the other if the healthcare worker is not washing their hands properly every after taking care of these children so uh, to curb or to address this problem the mother is given ampicillin IV for the group B streptococcal infection and then during the late pregnancy to reduce possible exposure of the newborn in preparation for the vaginal delivery. So, kunwari yung nanay, we found that the mother has this infection. What the, the doctors will do is that during the late uh, periods of pregnancy, the latter weeks of the, the mother's pregnancy, the mother will already be given ampicillin IV. To help decrease the number of the pathologic agents um, or the GBS para po when the mother delivers via normal spontaneous delivery or vaginal delivery, there is lower uh, risk for the child to contract that infection. Now, what are our assessment findings for patients with beta-hemolytic group B streptococcal infection? The signs and symptoms may not be manifested by the child immediately. But during the early onset, there may be signs of pneumonia. Pwedeng magkaroon ng takip niya, yung baby, or signs of shock, yung hypo, uh, hypotension, tachycardia, takip niya, and uh, hypotension. So, that's the sign. those are the signs of shock. Also, pallor or decreased urine output within the first days of life, they are the early onsets of the beta-hemolytic group B streptococcal infection. However, when we speak of the late onset, it occurs during the second to the fourth week of life after delivery. Now, meningitis will tend to occur if the child has been infected of the GBS. Uh, when we speak of meningitis, there is um, inclusions of lethargy, fever, loss of appetite, increased intracranial uh, pressure, or there is bulging of the fontanelles kasi nga nagkakaroon pa ng increased ICP or intracranial pressure on the head of the child. And children may also develop neurologic problems during the second to the fourth week of life if they are infected with the beta-hemolytic group B streptococcal infection. So since that is an infection, the best therapeutic management for GBS is giving antibiotics. So if a child manifests the different signs and symptoms of uh, the case, uh, we have to do blood screening or what we call uh, culture sensitivity testing for us to determine what antibiotics should be given to the child. And basically, the antibiotics that are given or the drug of choice for GBS are usually gentamicin, ampicillin, or penicillin. And uh, why? Because they are very effective for group B streptococcal infections. But then again, it's always best to refer to the doctor's order and it's always best to subject the child to culture sensitivity testing for the doctors to know what type of antibiotic should be used in the case of the patient. The next common infection that we typically see in the neonatal period is what we call ophthalmia neonatorum. 
I know for a fact that you're already familiar with this disease or this uh, condition because we have already discussed this during our previous uh, sessions together. Now, when we speak of ophthalmia neonatorum, it is an eye infection at birth or during the first months of life, during the first 30 days. The newborn contracts the infection during birth from the secretions from the vagina, spe specifically during normal spontaneous delivery. This infection can cause corneal lacerations, which can lead to blindness of the patient. Like I said, ophthalmia neonatorum is an eye infection that can be caught during birth by contact with the mother's birth canal or vagina that is infected with a uh, sexually transmitted disease. And the infection can either be bacterial, chlamydial, or viral. And the most common causative agents for ophthalmia neonatorum include Neisseria gonorrhea and chlamydia trachomatis. Assessment findings for ophthalmia neonatorum may include bilateral, conjunctivitis or redness and infection or swelling in both eyes and there is also pus that is secreted from both eyes in uh, ophthalmia neonatorum and the eyelids are basically edematous or parang namamaga. Now we have uh, preventive modalities for the condition. We give prophylactic installation of erythromycin or oxytetracycline ointment uh, and this is what we call CRIDS prophylaxis. And when we give this ointment, it should be from inner canthus to outer canthus. And it is placed on the lower eyelids of the child. Now, this is um, given within the first 24 hours after birth to prevent the child from developing ophthalmia neonatorum. In the event that a nurse or a midwife fails to give the CRIDS prophylaxis, and that infection ensues or nagkaroon nga ng ophthalmia na yunatorum yung ating pasyente, what do we do? So, the doctors may order culture sensitivity testing. So, the, the, they will get a sample of the exudate or the pus or the secretion coming from the eyes of the patient and then they will subject it to laboratory testing for the doctors to be able to determine what type of antibiotics should be given to these patients. Now, ceftriaxone and penicillin IV are basically the drugs of choice for bacterial ophthalmia neonatorum. However, if it is caused by chlamydial infection, patients are usually given ophthalmic erythromycin ointments. Now, in the event that there is also thick pus formation on the eyes of the child and that the child can barely open their eyes, we can use or we can do eye irrigation using plain normal saline solution to remove the discharges from the eyes. So when you give your eye, solu uh, uh, eye irrigation, you have to use barrier protections, specifically your gloves and goggles, to prevent, to prevent these microorganisms from coming in contact with your own eyes. Because like I said, this can also be contagious. Now, you also have to use a sterile medicine dropper or a bulb syringe while doing your eye irrigation. And you have to instill the PNSS laterally. So what you do is you give the NSS one eye at a time. Uh, you also have to prevent cross-contamination of the other eye if there is only one eye that is infected. Now, the mother is also treated for gonorrhea and chlamydia. We all know for a fact that the reason why the child has ophthalmia neonatorum is because of the exposure of the child to causative agents from sexually transmitted diseases. So since alam natin na yung bata ay meron siyang ophthalmia neonatorum, that also goes to show that the mother has a sexually transmitted disease. And we have to trace the sexual contacts of the mother so that we can also treat them as well. So hindi lang po dapat yung nana yung tinitreat natin for the STD. We also have to treat the father kasi siya ay sexual contact ni nanay or yung hardinero or yung kumpadre. Depende sa mga na-trace nyo na contacts ng mother because they also have to be taken into the loop and then they also have to be treated for their STD. 
Now, we also have to reassure the parents about normal eyesight of the child with early diagnosis and prognosis. Sabihin natin, mother, uh, hindi mabubulag yung baby kasi nabigyan naman natin siya ng uh, prophylaxis, creeds prophylaxis, or nabigyan naman natin siya ng antibiotic. So, that is one way of reassuring the patients about the normal eyesight of the child infected of ophthalmia neonatorum. Another common infection that the patients may contract during vaginal delivery is what we call the hepatitis B infection. Although it also occurs in patients who are born via cesarean section delivery. Now, this hepatitis B infection can be transmitted to the newborn through contact with infected vaginal blood at birth when the mother is tested positive for the virus. Now, we have to always subject our patients to what we call the HBSAG or the HEPA B surface antigen test. If the mother tests positive for HBSAG, that means that she uh, has the HEPA B virus or the HEPA B antigen. You have to remember that 70 to 90 percent of infected infants become chronic carriers of the hepatitis B virus. And uh, later on in their lives, they will develop liver cancer or liver cirrhosis because of the hepatitis B infection. Neonatal hepatitis B virus, like I said, is an infection that is acquired during delivery. It can be acquired during the NSD and also during the cesarean section delivery. Now, children or neonates are usually asymptomatic but uh, can cause chronic subclinical diseases. In the later part of their childhood or adulthood, they may have jaundice, they may have lethargy, they may have failure to thrive or hindi sila tumataba. They may have abdominal distension because of the enlargement of the liver or spleen. And they may also have clay-colored stool. And basically, HEPA B can be diagnosed by serology. We now discuss about the therapeutic managements for HEPA B. If the mother is tested positive for HEPA B surface antigen, or nalaman natin that the mother is positive with the HEPA B virus, the infant is usually given what we call the HBIG or the HEPA B immunoglobulin serum within the first 12 hours of birth to decrease the possibility of infection. So, kung positive nga yung antigen ni mother sa hepatitis B, we give the child the immunoglobulin serum for hepatitis B. And that should be given within the first 24, uh, I should say 12 hours after birth to decrease the possibility of infection. You also have to note that you should do gentle suctioning when you are doing this uh interventions to your patient. You want to avoid trauma to the mucous membrane because we don't want to uh, give a portal of entry for the virus to enter the bloodstream. Kasi nga po, hepatitis B is a bloodborne infection and as much as possible, we want to prevent trauma or we want to maintain the integrity of the mucous membrane. That's the reason why we have to do gentle suctioning. You also give full bath to the child immediately because we want to remove the infected vernix casosa, we want to remove the infected blood and other secretions to prevent the child from contracting the virus. Also, we defer giving breast milk because uh, the virus can also cross, uh, can also be transmitted via the breast milk. But uh, we can give, we can only give breast milk once the child has already been given the HEPA B immunoglobulin serum or the HBIG because the child is already protected when once he receives the serum. Bago tayo magpatuloy sa klase, mag-attendance check muna tayo. Ano? Now, for our attendance for this week, you have to send a voice memo to our group chat. Yan po yung number one challenge natin ngayon. Now, pumili kayo ng linya from your favorite movie and send that to our group chat or kung wala naman kayong maisip na linya from your favorite movie, you can just send a voice memo of the pinaka-epic na linya ng nanay nyo sa inyo. An example of that is, ito yung favorite na linya ng nanay ko sa amin. Dawat kayo lang at dawat tikwarta. 
Apa niya tamuyo ang tak-tak kinak ti kwarta? Your turn! Let us also discuss about the generalized herpes virus infection. When we speak of the herpes simplex virus 2 or the HSV2 virus, it is a prevalent vi virus that is found on women with multiple sex partners. And this virus can be contracted by the fetus in utero since this virus can cross the placenta. But more often, this virus is contracted from vaginal secretions from a herpetic vulvovaginitic mother. Okay, so manifestations generally occur between the first and the third week of life. Doon pa lang natin makikita yung mga symptoms or signs ng ating HSV2 virus. And they may rarely appear until as late as the fourth week of life. And neonates may, pre may present with local or disseminated disease like including skin vesicles or yung mga fluid-filled na mga... Uh, Formations on their skin, that is the most common type of the infection and it occurs 70% overall for the different patients with the herpes infection. So yun po yung mga pathognomonic sign na, na makikita natin for neonates with the herpes virus. Now if that newborn's skin is generally covered in vesicles or this fluid-filled rash on the skin of the child, uh, the herpes is usually contracted during pregnancy. Alam natin na during pregnancy nangyari yung infection if the child is already covered with vesicles okay, on the different parts of his or her body. If the newborn contracted herpes at, at approximately 4 to 7 days, they show loss of appetite, they show lo low-grade fever, they may, I, I mean they may have low-grade fever, they may have lethargy or stomatitis or what we call mouth ulcers as you can see on the picture above. And there may also be a few skin vesicles if the virus was only contracted approximately after 4 to 7 days. Now, when we speak of herpes vesicles, they are clustered. Usually, kumpul-kumpul sila. They are pinpoint in size and they are surrounded by a reddened base as I showed a while ago. After the appearance of the vesicles, the child will already start to feel ill. So after na mag-erupt po yung mga rashes na yon that are fluid-filled, magiging masakitin na po yung bata, they may develop dyspnea, they may have jaundice, or purpura, or what we call bruising on the skin, and also convulsions and even develop signs and symptoms of shock. And newborns who survive this herpes infection may develop permanent central nervous system damage. So maaring ma maapektuhan po yung utak ng bata pag siya ay nagkaroon ng HSV2 virus. Since we are dealing with a viral infection, the best bet that we can give to our patient or the best drug that we can give to our patient is an antiviral drug. And the drug of choice for HSV2 is a drug called acyclovir or Zovirax. Now you have to remember that prevention is always better than cure. And women with herpetic valvular lesions are advised to have CS delivery to reduce exposure of a child to the secretions. Kung upon inspection, nakita natin na yung mother ay meron na siyang herpetic valvular lesions on the vagina, wag na natin siyang i-allow na mag-NSD. We have to convince the mother that she delivers using cesarean section method so that we reduce the possibility of the child from being exposed to the virus. Aside from that, the infected newborn should be separated from other newborns because it can um, cross from one newborn to the other so the child should also be isolated even during treatment. Now, women with cold sores or what we call lesions, herpetic lesions on the face should not be allowed to handle or feed the newborns kasi hindi lang po sa vulva nakikita yung uh, herpetic lesions. It can also be seen on the face of the child. So kung may cold sore po yung nanay, we should not allow them to handle the child directly because uh, exposure of the newborn to the crust 
may lead to uh, contamination of the child. So, bag- baka yun pa yung mga maging cause ng kanyang uh, infection or contamination. So, we also have to encourage the mother with the infection to view the child from the nursery room window and just participate in the planning. So, uh, kahit hindi niya maalagaan or hindi niya ma-directly matouch yung bata, let the mother view the child from the nursery window and also take the opinion of the mother regarding the planning for the child's care. Ginagawa natin to because we want to have or we want to create the mother and child bonding. So pag in-involve natin yung nanay sa planning of the child's care, she still feels that she is a mother to a child. Another infection that the neonate may contract is what we call the HIV virus or the Acquired Immunodeficiency Syndrome or AIDS. This can be caused by placental transfer or direct contact with the mother's blood during birth. So the mother can pass the infection during pregnancy or during delivery via contact of the baby to the maternal blood. The risk of a mother transmitting HIV during pregnancy or during labor is very low for mothers with identified and treat, uh, treated uh, HIV during pregnancy. So you have to remember that if the mother is HIV positive but she is already undergoing treatment or she is already taking medications for her condition, the chance of transmitting the HIV virus is already very low. When treated, the chance of her baby getting that infection is already less than 1%. So, napakababa na po ng chance na ma-infect din yung bata ng HIV if the mother is already taking the retroviral drugs for HIV. So, what am I trying to say? Early testing and treatment can help decrease the number of babies that are born with HIV. So as much as possible, you have to advocate for regular testing uh, and screening for HIV, especially for men and women who are in their reproductive ages. Pag-usapan naman natin ang mga infants that are born of a diabetic mother. And I know for a fact that you're already familiar with these children because they are usually what we call the LGA or the large for gestational age. Uh, they tend to weigh heavier and measure longer. That's the reason why sometimes we call them macrosomic infants or macrosomic neonates. And these newborns may also develop congenital anomalies, specifically cardiac in nature. So maaring magkaroon din sila ng sakit sa puso if they are born of an of a diabetic mother. There is also what we call the caudal regression syndrome or there is hypoplasia of the lower extremities that are seen on newborns who are born of a diabetic mother. So what am I trying to say? When we speak of caudal regression, mas malaki yung katawan ng bata as compared or in contrast with their lower extremities. Aside from that, macrosomic infants also tend to be more prone to injury. Okay, physical injury kasi mahihirapan silang lumabas sa vagina ng nanay. Therefore, magkakaroon sila ng mga fractures, maaring magkaroon sila ng mga dislocations of bones, or even bruising. Okay, specifically on the shoulders and the neck. So what we do, para maiwasan po yung mga injuries na ito, is that we have to subject the mother uh, to cesarean section delivery specifically if there is cephalopelvic disproportion or possible shoulder dystocia so what the doctors will do is they will subject the mother to x-ray para makita if the size of the child can be accommodated by the pelvis of the mother if not the mother will be subjected to cesarean delivery now let us discuss about the therapeutic management for patients or neonates who are born of a diabetic mother. You have to prioritize treating hypoglycemia with early breastfeeding, giving bottle feeding, or even glucose infusions. And if you want to refresh your memory with your knowledge about treating LGAs or macrosomic infants, you can find another video wherein I discuss the therapeutic managements for these patients. 
contrary to the appearance of a patient or a neonate born of a diabetic mother who are usually large for their gestational age, neonates of a drug-dependent mother tend to be small for their gestational age. You have to remember that if a mother is dependent on a drug or what we call a drug addict, the newborn may also manifest withdrawal syndrome or what we call the neonatal abstinence syndrome shortly after birth because the child no longer receives the drug from the placenta. Now, this syndrome may include irritability and disturbed sleep patterns. The child may also have tremors or constant movements of the extremities which may also lead to abrasions. They may have frequent sneezing, shrill or high-pitched cry, and they may also have hyperreflexes or hyperreflexia or clonus or neuromuscular irritability. Nagjijitters yung bata pag siya ay merong uh, drug withdrawal syndrome. Now, they also may have tachypnea and that may cause hyperventilation or metabolic alkalosis and that may also they that they may also have vomiting and diarrhea which may lead to fluid loss and secondary dehydration so those are the typical signs and symptoms of our patients born of a drug dependent mother in treating these patients you have to remember that therapy is usually individualized according to the severity and nature of the signs and symptoms manifested by the neonate. So palliative po yung ating approach when we give treatment or therapeutic management to these kinds of patients. Now, we have to keep the child in an isolated area or environment to prevent stimulus. Because alam natin na merong hyperactivity yung bata and that nagkakaroon siya ng mga jitters na ganun, you have to prevent that from uh, happening by giving the child less stimuli. That's the reason why you have to place the child in an isolated environment. So the best thing that you have to do is to place the child in a small isolation room that is quiet and dimly lit para po less lang yung kanyang stimuli. If the newborn is un is already able to suck, you should allow them to use pacifiers. And also, bottle feeding, you also have to monitor the INO because you also have to uh, maintain fluid and electrolytes. Now, if you ask me, bucket bottle feeding, basically, if a mother is drug dependent and drugs and narcotics are flowing inside her body, there is a possibility that the child may again receive the drug from the breast milk. So as much as possible, we give bottle milk to the child and not breast milk. If the neonate born of a drug dependent mother is already showing signs and symptoms of dehydration from second, uh, secondary to diarrhea and vomiting, you can already start giving IVF. We want to give them fluid rescue because we want to combat or address the fluid and electrolyte loss from the diarrhea and vomiting. You have to remember that breast milk should not be given to these patients because we want to prevent narcotics from the breast milk or the breasts of the mother from passing to the child. Once you already have identified the mother is a drug addict or drug dependent, you also have to include her for your treatment or therapeutic management for possible withdrawal syndrome. You also have to do continuous monitoring of the child after discharge because they may develop long-term neurologic problems because of the long-term effects of their drug exposure. Like drug-dependent mothers, patients who are or neonates born of uh, alcoholic mothers can also have dire consequences in their health. Now, you have to remember that alcohol crosses the placenta in the same concentration as in the maternal bloodstream. So, ibig sabihin kung gaano kadami yung consumption ng nanay ng alcohol, ganun din yung level na alcohol na pumapasok po sa bloodstream ng bata. Now, alcohol has teratogenic effects and that may lead to the pr problematic formation of the organs of the child. 
newborns may also have pre- and postnatal growth restrictions or retardations if they are exposed to alcohol in utero. Now, there is also possible central nervous system damage involvements. Pwede silang magkaroon ng cognitive challenge or they may develop cerebral palsy or even microcephaly. Now, the picture that is posted here is a typical example of a child with a fetal alcohol syndrome or yan po yung kanilang uh, facial characteristics. They have small eye openings, they have small filthrum, and they have thin upper lip. So kung ganyan po yung itsura ng bata, you can uh, be sure that they are born of, a, of an alcoholic mother. If the child has fetal alcohol syndrome, during their neonatal period, the child may show tremors or fidgeting or irritability and weak sucking. And that may lead to possible aspiration or pwedeng magkaroon din sila ng poor feeding which will lead to failure to thrive or maaaring hindi na sila bumigat or lumaki because of their poor feeding. Now, they may also suffer from sleep disturbances, which is very common for patients with fetal alcohol syndrome, depending on the mother's alcohol level. So that means that the child may be always asleep or always awake. Now, like I said, uh, being exposed to alcohol in utero may lead to possible mental retardation or cognitive problems, which is the most serious effects of what we call the FAS or the fetal alcohol syndrome. This may lead to hyperactivity which may also occur even during the school age. Surprisingly, that's already the end of the line for this subject. Yun na pala yung aking last slide. And this will already be the last pre-recorded lecture for our subject for this semester. Maraming maraming salamat for always attending our virtual classes and thank you so much for the awesome semester. Nawa po lahat kayo ay maging successful in your uh, chosen career and lahat sana kayo ay maging responsible health workers in the future. But before I end my semester with you, I'd like to pose a challenge for each and every student that I have for this class. Is the lift's only purpose to fall? Were you born in this world to run a cycle of eat, sleep, go to school, get a decent job, and then eventually die? Or are you here to make a difference? With that being said, maraming maraming salamat everyone. This is Dr. Jeff Leireboron signing off.